Good morning, afternoon, and evening, all. Um, my name is Ivan Zubo. I'm the head of research for Financial Services Capital, and today we're going to discuss the status, the state of European private equity, financial services private equity, um, with the founder, chief investment officer, and managing partner, but most importantly, a very loyal Longhorn, Matt Hansen. So, Matt, let's start with the most important question: Why is now the right time to invest in European financial services? That's a good question. I mean, I appreciate you asking. So, um, Europe and the United States uh, are share many commonalities, but the response to the global financial crisis is not one of them. Um, in the United States, there was capital forced into banks, um, assets were marked, uh, life moved on, and the banks have since recovered, as has the health of the financial system in Europe in the United States, whereas in Europe, um, there was a bit of a, you know, lack of recognition of the severity of the crisis. And the can was, you know, effectively repeatedly kicked down the road. So, you know, while in the United States, you've seen banks and, you know, the very large banks recover, you know, hundreds of percentage, it, uh, points, you know, in, in Europe, the, the banking and financial services sector is, is broadly speaking, uh, cheaper today than it was, you know, even at the depths of the crisis, uh, which means there's just been a continued deterioration um, uh, in the sector. So as an investor, when you're looking at value, um, you know, if you want to look at sort of the developed world economies, um, and then what sector to focus on. In the United States, you know, all sectors were covered, including financial services. In Europe, you know, uh, even, you know, uh, and, and, the, and in the United States, even post-COVID, uh, the, 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 the valuation recovery has been pretty broad and deep. In Europe, um, I would say all sectors, barring financial services, um, meaning banks, insurance, asset managers, uh, and other participants have recovered um, uh, quite substantially. Now there's been a correction uh, associated with uh, the COVID pandemic, but um, the the financial services sector, you know, on any uh, basis of valuation is the cheapest it's been in our lifetimes. Um, and that's stock prices, it's multiples, it's price to book values, price to earnings. Um, so if you're, you know, a value focused investor and you want to invest in developed market economies, um, I, it's my opinion that the, the number one place to look is in European financial services, because I don't think that there's a lot of value left, um, uh, in the United States. Um, uh, you know, certainly there's some, uh, discrete opportunities that are always available to, you know, the smart uh, minds in, in, the uh, in the United States investment community. But by and large, um, you know, when you're thinking about a place to <coughs> shift risk into, you know, it would be out of the recovered uh, sectors and the recovered economies into uh, the places that have yet to recover. And, um, so, so I think that entry prices in European financials are attractive. And then I think it's very difficult to do financials uh, as a public investor. There's just too much complexity. There's too much unknown, you know, both in the businesses and the balance sheets. But uh, for private equity, where you can do thorough due diligence on the books and uh, go into detail on the operations and build you know, very strong recovery plans. Um, I think that that's, that's really the only way to approach it. And, and, and I have quite a bit of experience, um, because I moved my family to Austria in 2008, when, uh, my employer at the time, Cerberus had acquired, you know, it's, it's largest financial services company, uh, in Europe, uh, which was Babog which stands for Bank for Unions and Labor. So it was a heavily unionized, socialized uh, bank. And 2008, you know, the bank was in 
in dire straits. Uh, they were going to announce a 650 million year loss. Um, and we really had to roll our sleeves up to transform that bank from the inside out. Um, and the fruits of it were pretty profound. I mean, it went from that negative 650 to a positive 650. The return on equity, which is by and large the most commonly used metric of performance, uh, was turned from low single digits to high double digits, one of the highest ROEs in the European banking sector. Uh, the second most common statistic of operational success is uh, the cost to income ratio, which went from around 90% to around 40%, which was is now one of the lowest in Europe. So, you know, from the inside out, when you get into the nitty gritty uh, of operating these businesses, there are a lot of levers that are unavailable to, you know, regular way public market investors, like, you know, identifying units and divisions not earning their cost of capital or, uh, you know, shifting the assets on the balance sheet into more productive uh, areas uh, to deploy risk. And, you know, in the performing credit markets, um, you know, it, it, you could generally say that the, the approach to performing credit is, is a little less sophisticated than the approach to other areas um, of the financial markets. And I'm not a believer in the efficient markets hypothesis in any case, but I, I would say performing credit is especially inefficient. So the opportunity to shift uh, the balance sheet deployment inside of a bank into things that are both higher yielding and lower risk um, was one that we took advantage of. Uh, and that internal shift to make the balance sheet more productive, uh, which was one of my clear mandates at BAWAG, is what unlocked, you know, a profoundly deep operational turnaround because as the assets got more productive, that that allowed us to have the earnings to restructure the cost base. Um, and then you got into a virtuous cycle of higher productivity, lower structural cost base, um, which then created more earnings, allowed you to put more uh, of the balance sheet to work. Um, you know, what we didn't have available to us in that sort of 2008 to 2012 time period in which I was inside the bank as the shareholders representative uh, was technology and, and a facility with technology. So, um, yeah, and that's no one's fault. Um, the technologies weren't available mm -hmm. at the time, you know, and, and as a broadly speaking, as an investor, you know, they're the, the very large private equity houses like your Cerberus's and, and, and others, um, you know, they're not tech focused venture capital type firms. I mean, Kleiner Perkins is very good at what they do and, you know, and Cerberus is very good at what they do. And so the, the ability to, to utilize and deploy technology um, at those large, uh, you know, more traditional private equity firms is not inherently, you know, their strong suit. Um, and I think that is, you know, one of the core opportunities today. So with a, you know, focused shareholder, and that's one of the problems with, you know, the large multinational conglomerate behemoths, whether it's, you know, your large insurance companies, your large banks are, you have a very diffuse shareholder base, mm -hmm. you know, no, given shareholder has uh, the ability to drive an agenda of transformation. And there is a lot of vested interest in the status quo and a lot of inertia uh, in the status quo. So to affect change, you know, and create value, I think that the private equity approach is the right one. And you don't have to buy, you know, Deutsche Bank as a whole or, uh, credit agricole as a whole, but you can buy subsidiaries of those uh, where you can do full due, due diligence and come up with business plans. And the keys to creating value are, you know, number one, you got to buy right. You know, you only get one chance to do that. So <clears throat> buying from a parent company who is trading at a 70% discount to book 
for example, is a good starting place because that allows you the opportunity to pay a significant discount to book for the subsidiary and still have it be seen as a creative transaction for the parent, right? And that you can't do that in the United States because if you wanted to buy, you know, just hypothetically speaking, uh, the Canadian subsidiary of J.P. Morgan, you know, you, you'd have to pay a significant premium to book for that divestiture to be accretive. But if you wanted to buy something off of some of these uh, behemoths in Europe that trade at these massive discounts, you would also be paying a massive discount, right? Whether, you know, wherever you want to look, you know, the big banks in France, the big banks in the UK, the big banks in Germany, they all trade at 50% plus discounts to book, which means that when you look at acquiring a subsidiary or a platform or a division out of there, um, you know, your starting point is a discount to book. Uh, which is obviously a better starting point than a premium to book. And then to create value, you know, what I learned from my VAWA experience is that you need to have deep operational expertise and excellence because the, the transformation happens from within, right? And it happens from being able to operate that business uh, better than it had been operated before. And a lot of the under uh, utilization of operating efficiencies comes from the diffuse shareholder bases and lack of agenda being driven by the shareholders in the public company environment. And there's also a bit of a social responsibility that banks have. <clears throat> Not that you know we disregard any of that social responsibility. It's obviously very important. But um, if you have a, a controlling or highly influential stake, you know, such that you can drive an agenda. Um, at one of these institutions, you can affect change, right? You can do the basics, which are, you know, redeploying the balance sheet into more productive asset categories, which gives you more earnings and a higher ROE. And then you can attack the embedded, you know, cost structure, which, you know, prior to a new owner coming in had been seen as intractable. Um, or in, in, you know, unresolvable. And, 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 you know, with a lot of hard work, uh, you can overcome that inertia. Um, so you have to have operational excellence, which is one of the, you know, things that financial services capital is built around. You know, all of the partners are operators first, you know, whether it's the chief operating officer of the largest private bank in Russia or the first vice chairman of BNP Ukraine or the chief of staff to Mila Boutin at Santander, or the head of innovation at Discover Card, or the CEO of another Austrian bank, uh, I got to know during my time there, we're all operators first. So that ability to operate the assets that we invest in is crucial to developing a plan for value creation on an operational basis. So that's our first, you know, must have pillar of, of approaching this sector uh, in the right way. The second is, you know, a facility with enabling technology. So the technologies that have come online since 2008, you know, and I would say it's not just a matter of the technology being available, right? And you don't have to do much more than take an Uber to your bank branch to realize that these, that these, these worlds are very different, you know, that, that the, the, the financial services industry is quite the laggard um, when it comes to utilizing some of these technologies, whether it's cloud-based uh, systems or big data, AI analytics, um, digital authentication, etc. And that laggardness comes from uh, inertia, of course, and the pain of changing something and then the best interests of the people that built these systems, you know, that have been running for decades. Um, and most importantly, the regulators, you know, have only recently gotten comfortable with these uh, technologies being implemented on their banking system. And, and the regulator is the most important person uh, to satisfy and please if you're going to invest in the financial services sec sector. And we never lose sight of that. So. You know, even if you did have a facility with technology and the ability to implement and utilize it, it might not have been effective in 2008 to 2012 because the regulators weren't comfortable with it. 
But there's been a sea change in that. And I give credit where credit is due to some of the challenger entrants in both the banking, insurance, and alternative finance sectors for driving the acceptance of these technologies from the regulator's perspective. And that acceptance has happened depending on the jurisdiction, you know, only in the last, you know, year or two, right? So financial services capital and the way that we approach investing you know, couldn't have even existed three years ago, hmm. right? So this is a bespoke firm for a bespoke opportunity. And we have Marislav Bublik, who is, you know, frankly, uh, as credible as they get for financial services infrastructure, updating and transformation, um, because he's done it so many times in the past, uh, in both scale and scope. And we also have, uh, uh, started to build out what we call our toolkit. And that's uh, core banking in the cloud, it's big data AI, it's uh, digital payment gateways and digital uh, transactions. And with that toolkit available to us, and that's proprietary um, and permanent, and it's also uh, part of our permanent uh, portfolio, we will be able to more rapidly transform the assets that we invest in. So that that toolkit, but more importantly than even the tools, is the understanding of the technology and the understanding of its implementation, right? And there are certain situations where, you know, the juice won't be worth the squeeze, you know, to implement and transform the infrastructure of certain institutions will be too difficult or too expensive to make it pay off. And you have to be able to, you know, make that assessment over the course of your due diligence. And I think we're pretty uniquely positioned to do that you know, with Miroslav um, and his skill set and our team, um, which is entirely composed of operators. And then lastly, um, to do this right, you need deep sector expertise. And then given the importance of the people that hold the keys to the kingdom, which are the regulators, um, you need to have sector expertise in the geographies in which you're going to be investing. So, um, you know, I, I, I've i spent a lot of time in my career sort of translating Europe to an American uh, headquarters or an American investment committee. I did that at Madison Dearborn when I was working out of the Madison Dearborn London office. I did that um, in Cerberus uh, when I was doing private equity deals in London uh, before Cerberus had a European presence. Uh, I did that in Austria uh, for the bank uh, to a New York headquarters and I did for Cerberus and then ultimately Atlas most recently. So, um, you know, the, the, the American mindset is a wonderful thing and I'm proud to be an American and I love our can do and straightforward approach to business. Um, but it is not, uh, you know, always applicable to every situation. Um, you know, if you were to think that because something was working in Miami, it will work in Seattle. You know, that's by and large true, you know, in the United States where you, at the end of the day, have one, you know, national regulatory body in the mm -hmm. Fed. But if you were to try and say that because something works well in Budapest, it's going to work well in Amsterdam, um, that would be very misguided, right? So the economy of scale that you're kind of used to as an American doesn't really apply to Europe because you have, you know, 31 different countries. Each one of those countries has its own regulator, right? They have their own culture, they have their own consumer behavior. Um, so you have to understand not just Europe as a whole, but Europe in its regions, right? And we're set up for exactly that. You know, we have uh, Martin, who's Viennese covering Northern Europe. We have Miroslav, who is <clears throat> Central Eastern European in Prague covering Central Eastern Europe. We have Rafa in Spain covering Southern Europe. Myself in London, Madrid, and then <clears throat> we have our fifth partner in the United States just because the United States is still the largest economy in the world. Uh, that's where a lot of, if not most of the innovation happens. And you have to have uh, a, a footprint in the United States. Uh, it's just, it's a must have in, in today's environment. And, and, and that, that's where a lot of the change starts. 
Uh, it's also where a lot of the LPs sit. Uh, so to be close to the LPs, you need to have someone that can speak for the firm in the United States. But our approach to Europe is, you know, you have to get involved in the countries in which the institutions that you're investing are regulated. You have to know the regulator, you have to speak their language, you have to speak their culture, you have to understand those consumers and the consumer behavior as it applies to that economy, right? And you have to recognize that Budapest and Amsterdam are different, that the regulatory systems are different, that the regulators care about different things, um, and they need to be approached uh, with the respect that they've earned. Um, so those are the three things that I, you know, saw that were the must-haves to take advantage of, I think, this, you know, generational opportunity to invest in financial services in Europe. So the operating expertise, the facility with enabling technologies, and then the dedicated sector expertise in the geographies in which you're investing, where you have people close to the regulators and close to the jurisdictions in which you're investing uh, are essential. You know, flying over from New York once a month uh, is, is these, these companies, you gotta get too involved in the day-to-day -day minutia to really drive change. Um, and you can't do it on a fly and fly out basis. You have to be local. Great. Um, so, you know, in your first few pieces for the Center for Global Business, you've uh, discussed the European Hamilton moment. Uh, of course, by that, you meant um, just all the facilities that the EU and the ECB has put together to aid in the, uh, the fallout of the COVID crisis. Um, What's changed, you know, since you've initially wrote, written the two papers, and sort of how do you see this playing out? I, I I'm I'm smiling because it's it's one of the unusual times when I've when I've done some prognostication and it's and it's turned out, you know, correct. Uh, it's always dangerous to forecast uh, political futures, um, as many many pundits found out in 2016. Um, but you know the the struggle in Europe is not too dissimilar from the struggle that America experienced um, in the late 1700s, right? This this pull between states and federalism, um, which is what the phrase Hamilton moment encapsulates. So you know in Europe you have the ability to tax and spend within a given country's uh, remit, you know, and while the EU and the ECB have existed as supranational bodies, uh, they have never taken the next step, which is to have supranational spending authority, right, or supranational uh, guaranteeing of liabilities, which implies a federalization and fiscal transfer between member countries. So, you know, that is a huge Rubicon that the EU has always been hesitant and even approaching much less crossing. And when the UK was part of the EU, um, because of the UK's permanent position as this sort of, do we really want to be here, uh, resistance to Europe and resistance to federalism and resistance to the center getting stronger, um, this never could have even come close to happening if Brexit hadn't happened, right? And one of the reactions to Brexit was that, you know, the every us needs a them, right? So with Brexit, the EU found out, you know, got to define who us was, right? In that protracted negotiation process bound them together, you know, more strongly than they had ever been bound before. And it always struck me, um, living here in the UK as an American, I'm sort of a dispassionate observer of the process, um, uh, that in the UK, as those negotiations took place, there were lots of leaks. You know, what happened behind closed doors was always in the papers the same day, you know, or the next day. Whereas the EU, despite its, you know, seemingly fractious uh, uh, stability, um, 
was very uh, uh, negotiations was, was a very tight ship. Everyone said the same things, walked the same lines. Leaks were kept to a minimum, um, and they really did negotiate with one voice. And they took a hard line, um, and 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 that the outcome is is sort of uh, independent of the process, right? What they achieved in the process was a stronger unification of the idea of Europe as a entity, not a combination of member states, but as a single body. And also having the UK removed from, you know, the decision-making process thereafter um, is what unlocked this Hamilton moment in Europe. And this Hamilton moment was the issuance of EU-wide uh, uh, you know, funding uh, in the tune of initially 750 billion euros and then topped up to 1.35 trillion euros. And my, again, prognostication is that that number will simply grow, right? Now, this is the first time the EU has, as a cohesive unit, decided to uh, issue money, right? That is guaranteed by, you know, the group as opposed to any individual state. And yes, there is a fiscal transfer that will be involved in, in, in the distribution of this 1.35 trillion euros. You know, there will be a fairly transparent distribution from Northern countries to Southern countries. And the pandemic is kind of the, you know, it, of course it's tragic and, and we sympathize with, with all of the, the associated and direct suffering with the pandemic, but this nature of crisis um, was something that they could easily rally around, right? So first you had the Brexit negotiations, then you had this disease, right? This virus that knew no boundaries, knew no borders, right? That was global in nature. So the response to this boundaryless uh, pandemic, this boundaryless virus that didn't see these lines drawn on a map was pretty cohesive, right? And the package of rescue in response to something that didn't see borders also didn't see borders. I mean, it was the perfect event to create the environment that unlocked the crossing of the Rubicon for Europe's Hamilton moment, right? And it was no small figure. 750 billion was a big number. 1.35 trillion is a big number. And for the EU to bear the responsibility for raising and issuing uh, and distributing and collecting that as a supranational uh, institution, you know, that Hamilton moment and that Rubicon, you know, has been crossed. Um, the center has gotten stronger. The federalism of Europe has happened. Um, and it's, it's difficult to go back from. And as this pandemic, I think, will recur uh, and the response will need to recur, uh, this will get bigger, right? And then it's also important to note that 390 billion of the package are grants. So, you know, grants don't have to be repaid. It's literally free money, right? And when you have the EU printing free money with the ECB and then distributing it, you know, that is basically how the American tax system works. You know, um, they can be described very differently. The acronyms are different, but the effect and the mechanics are almost identical. So obviously lots of money to be distributed. Um, how, is, uh, how is FSC helping in this process? Could you talk about what are our portfolio companies doing? Yeah, so, you know, we, we started in November, you know, um, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a courageous or foolish thing to start a private equity firm in the middle of the biggest global health crisis we've seen in our lifetimes, um, at least since 1918. Um, but, you know, we've been fortunate in that 
our first three deals have um, not just gotten through the crisis, but actually grown uh, in the crisis and made progress in the crisis. And, you know, one of the things we did during the crisis was to batten down the hatches on our toolkit, right? So we wanted the platform that we've established here, you know, not just the building out of the people and the hiring of fantastic personnel like Ivan Zubo, but to also embed the toolkit that we're going to need to drive the transformation. And the clue is in the name, right? Enabling technologies was chosen very specifically, right? People like to use the word fintech, we don't. Um, I think fintech, um, sometimes people get caught up in technology for technology's sake. Um, and there is an infatuation, you know, potentially, you know, bubble uh, level of enthusiasm for fintech. But I think what gets lost there is the utility Right, and when what we have at our core is the utility of these technologies. Like, if the technologies don't enable transformation, we're not interested. So that's why you know the the cornerstone is cloud-based computing, right? For you know core systems for banking, for insurance, for you know alternative and consumer finance, and that allows for digital end-to-end -end processing. You know, which is how the world has to work following the pandemic. You know, t from touchless pay to, you know, no more data entry to no more paper forms. You know, everything is, has to be end to end digital. Um, and the systems that, you know, were, were built in the 70s and 80s, which are server based and very manual, um, you know, while the transition plans to get out of these onto the cloud and fully digital into in you know infrastructure may have been and was definitely in the cards for all of these financial institutions but they were four five ten year plans you know they're now four five ten month plans so the nimbus platform the barian platform you know they've seen order volumes you know increase dramatically Right, the digital payment gateway that Varian has, the digital payment uh, 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 acceptance and and data capture, um, you know, have become that much more important, and they serve exclusively e-commerce merchants. So, you know, as you can imagine, e-commerce has been one of the largest beneficiaries of the crisis. So, being a payment gateway focused on e-commerce by luck or by design has been a very serendipitous place to be. And then of course, digital end-to-end -end cloud-based virtual banking systems, you know, Nimbus has implement, sold and implemented more banks since April than it had in its prior, the 18 months prior to the crisis, right? Which, which just speaks to that recognition that physical branch-based in-person banking, you know, was fast forwarded into the past and the adoption of cloud-based end-to-end digital systems has been brought forward right by many years and nimbus has been a huge beneficiary of that and lastly uh you know our consumer uh, credit business that that one of our uh partners uh has been working on for several years um you know, happens to be in a very stable consumer sector uh, and he is implementing uh, or in the process of implementing some of our enabling technologies uh, that are going to create a tremendous amount of value for that asset. Um, and the, the consumers um, underpinning that business are largely pensioners on fixed income that have been you know, unaffected by the crisis um, in that their incomes were stable before and are stable after. And, you know, we haven't seen any deterioration <clears throat> in the performance of the loan book there. Um, and then the funding uh, that's, that, that has been made available to it is, puts it in a pretty unique position. So um, uh, our, our, our initial set of exposures are performing very well um, and we're very fortunate in that regard 
Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that Nimbus was the platform um, that was utilized to disperse the SBA PPP loans in the United States. So that was the Small Business Association Payment Protection uh, 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 Program uh, in the United States, where the federal government was dispersing credit through the banking system. And Nimbus was the uh, system that was utilized to disperse those funds. And they dispersed you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions uh, in a very seamless process. And I think what's remarkable about that is that Nimbus was able to develop that over the course of three days. You know, so when you think about the other core banking oligopolists, um, you know, that nimbleness and that responsiveness, uh, I think is hard to beat. You know, and they recently did an implementation on a bank in 38 days, right? And, and, and these core banking implementations are generally measured in years. So that nimbleness, that responsiveness, uh, I think that that's a good corollary to, you know, the question that is soon to be asked, which is how does this European, you know, SBA PPP program, the 1.35 trillion we talked about earlier, how does that actually get dispersed? Right, and having a reference where this is the way it was done in another country, you know, do you want to, you know, investigate that as a starting point? You know, I think that that could be a very powerful uh, way to bring Nimbus into Europe. So, you know, obviously, with uh, as a consequence of COVID nineteen, we are likely to see a substantial rise in non performing loans, um, and especially after you know some of these uh, stimulus measures that are and many of which are meant to be temporary expire. How bad do you think things will get? And also, which asset classes are you most worried about? Yeah. Um, look, I I think given the policy response. It's a little too early to tell how bad things will get. I know Oliver Wyman, you know, has some estimates and the, uh, you know, that range between 400 and 830 billion. Um, you know, it, it's obviously going to be big. Uh, I think, you know, having been an operator inside of a bank and given our collective operational experience in European financial services of 150 plus years, um, you know, we think about it, banking is as complicated as you make it, right? Um, you're, you're at its core, you know, you're taking in money here and you're loaning it out here, right? And that, that difference, that net interest margin has to cover your overhead and then some, and that's, that's, that's banking in its simplest form. Um, and the way that you deploy those assets, again, just getting it, distilling it down to its very bare essentials. If you, invest in a, call it bad asset, and you know that it's bad, call it an NPL or something, and you price it like it's an NPL, that's okay, right? You've, you've priced the risk appropriately. If you invest in a good asset and you price it as a good asset, and it is a good asset, that's okay, right? You price the risk, you're gonna be fine. Uh, if you invest in a good asset and you're able to price it as if it's a bad asset, you know, that's a great outcome. The danger zone, right, in this quadrant is when you have a bad asset and you price it like it's a good asset. And following the global financial crisis, there was, and this tends to happen in the financial services uh, uh, ecosystem, you know, you get these systemic convictions that a certain type of deal or a certain type of asset is safe. Right, and the herd's conviction following the global financial crisis was that commercial real estate was that safe asset class. So for the past 12 years, you know, credit has poured into commercial real estate because it was safe. But the pandemic has turned that on its head. You know, no matter how you look at it from a commercial real estate perspective, obviously bricks and mortar retail was already on the decline and that has been, become even more pronounced. Um, but even offices, right, with social distancing and the inability to utilize the space like 
you know, corporations have since the dawn of the, you know, factory in the 1950s and open plan offices and cubicles and cramming as many people into square footage as you possibly can, you know, that's a thing of the past. And you're seeing rent strikes and you're seeing the, the rental rates and the returns if you're owning property and you're leasing it out going down. And that will, of course, have an impact on the valuations. Now, banks will tell you that they lent at a safe loan to value ratio. And safe is generally considered 60 to 70% of value. And, you know, by and large, that is a true statement. You know, do I think that commercial real estate is gonna go down more than 40%? No, I don't think that across the board, commercial real estate is gonna go down 40%. So, you know, they're not wrong, but I think the second derivative that needs to be taken into account is that if you're at 60 to 70% LTV, you know, your risk weighting on that asset is quite low. The problem is that the post-COVID revaluation of these assets could be down 20, 30%, right? Now, in some cases, you will be over lent, your principal will actually be impaired and there will be genuine losses. In other cases, you know, you'll think you're safe, but you're still gonna be hit with the fact that your new LTV is now in a much higher risk category and your risk weightings will skyrocket, which is gonna you know, create a capital need um, that they don't have the earnings to fulfill themselves, right? So then in the search to backfill the capital that's created by the higher risk weightings on the commercial real estate, you know, all of these institutions and insurance is probably bigger in this than banking, will need to sell subsidiaries, sell divisions, create assets out of businesses to get their regulatory capital uh, increased. And that is a perfect buying opportunity because you will have a whole spectrum of forced sellers that need to generate capital from the sale of non-core and even core uh, parts of their business. You know, and there are parts of their business that aren't even business units like mortgage loan servicing um, that will turn into businesses. And because there were no book values associated with them, then, then, then you have the opportunity to negotiate, right? If you're gonna buy a serv mortgage servicer um, out of a large bank, you know, the negotiation is the servicing fee that you're willing to pay me now as the owner of your soon to be externalized mortgage servicer mm -hmm. is gonna impact the amount of capital that you're able to create with this transaction. And then us as buyers of that newly created company, um, we'll be able to present effectively what we call a Chinese menu, which is, you know, for the following rates, you know, we can NPV them and give you this much capital, right? And you get to decide. Do you want uh, to optimize costs going forward or capital at the present? And they're gonna to lean towards capital at the present, which is a very good deal-making environment. And, and what I talked about is, is pretty into the minutia, right, of financial services and understanding the problems that the managers and boards of these large multinational uh, institutions are wrestling with. And if you haven't worked inside of them, if you don't know how those decision processes are made, if you don't understand the balance between cash and capital, um, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> so the difference between uh, capital and liquidity is indeed a, quite an important one. Yeah, cash and capital uh, are, are, they sound the same, but they're, they're in fact very different, but coming Back to cash. Uh, let, give me the opportunity to turn 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 the tables and ask you uh, a, a question about that because um, you know you were uh, number one ranked uh, uh, Euro money analyst in the financial services sector for four years. You know, and and uh, at Morgan Stanley, HSBC, and 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 others. Um, so you know, just just sort of 
if if I'm you know either sitting in Brussels or uh, you know one of the constituent com countries of Europe, you know, uh, it seems like, and and not just in Europe but everywhere, we're in this era of free money with governments running budget deficits of double digits and you know these multi-trillion uh, euro, dollar, etc. Packages uh, being rolled out, um, you know, but seeming, you know, lack of uh, repercussions. I mean, are, are we in some sort of financial nirvana um, where they can do this perpetually, or is there ever going to be some kind of a reckoning? Um, yeah, no, I think it's, it's a great question and a pretty difficult one. So uh, thanks for lobbing that at me. But let, let me give you the, the best I can here. So. I think the government response has really been anchored around sort of four different pillars. So first of all, as you correctly pointed out, we have massive budget deficits well into double digits. And that's something that would have been unheard of under the normal time, so to speak. Um, and as an investor, if you actually want to run away from it, you don't really have an option because, you know, back in the day, it was usually it would be one country that would be in trouble and have this issue. So you could say, OK, US is running double digit deficit. Great. I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to go to Japan. Guess what? Today, everybody's doing the same, so you have nowhere to hide. The second point is, you know, we've seen a massive expansion of central bank balance sheet, which has been basically funded by, um, by printing money, because guess who is buying most of this, this new debt? It's the central banks. Um, the third point that, you know, that we've seen is um, massive expansion of government powers. So I read an article just earlier this week that actually the bankruptcies in Europe uh, depends on a country, but are down anywhere from sort of between 20 and 40 percent uh, based on what they seasonally happen over the last five years. And that to me uh, means that actually this government support, you know, the aid packages are actually supporting some companies that probably should have gone out of business just by natural uh, flow of, you know, companies to go out of business. But the last and probably not least, probably the most important thing underpinning all of this is low inflation. Um, you know, governments have been able to issue a lot of debt and keeping inflation at least nominally low. Now, um, both you and I know that inflation is a funny thing because certainly if we look at the official measures, it is low. But if you have children in private schools or God forbid you're trying to buy a flat in London, we have seen massive asset price inflation or, you know, school fees inflation. Um, you know, the cost of SMU today is probably three times what it was when, when I went, and I'm not that old, um, or I, so I like to think. Um, but, um, you know, I think in general, sort of every era has reflects priorities of the government. So uh, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, the priority was we can't have another Great Depression. Um, in the aftermath of the 70s and 80s, the main you know, priority of policymakers was we cannot have another hyperinflation. And I think today the priority really is that we cannot, you know, afford having sort of massive economic disruption, uh, whether that's defined as further inequality or whatever one defines it. Um, but indeed, this is the one thing I'm sort of most concerned about in, in what's happening is that ultimately if inflation were to spike, uh, the house of cards, if you will, might crumble. Now, you know, the one interesting example I would throw out there is Austria, for instance, issued a 100-year bond, so it, which is not due until 2120, with a coupon of 0.8%. The last one they did, uh, I believe it was in 2017, had a coupon of over 2%. And, and this 100-year and this bond has actually rallied since. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so, you know, as you know, having lived in Austria, Austria in 1917 was an empire of around 80 million people. Austria today is a, is a beautiful country, but of 8 million people and probably 10% of the territory that it has as the empire 100 yeah. years ago. Interestingly enough, Vienna is still right around less than a, less than a million people. So one of the great things about that as a city and the reason that wins, you know, the, the I think Monaco's number one city living in the world uh, perennially is the fact that, look, the city was built for this 80 million person empire. Indeed. It was built for you know, the Rome of its day, uh, or New York of its day, and, uh, you know, since World War One has, you know, uh, obviously seen a dramatic decline in pop population, but the infrastructure is much larger than the population, which actually makes for very easy living. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, no, but uh, so, so, you know, I, obviously the, the, the reckoning may very well be that, you know, when things become unstable, th things can destabilize rather quickly. 
but having said that, and you know, without trying to be Cassandra, I think, as you know, you alluded to in, in the earlier section of this interview, in financial services where there's complexity, there's opportunity, and when where you know there is complexity and there's opportunity for which you need a skill set to understand it, there's also opportunity to make money. So, you know. And one of the things that the technologies, uh, as, as you've spoken about, allow banks to also do is innovate much more quickly in terms of products. So, for instance, uh, you know, a, a bank in Denmark uh, about a year ago or so introduced the first negative rate mortgage. Now, I'm willing to bet you that uh, the legacy systems might not even be able to do such a thing as negative rate mortgage because it didn't exist. And, you know, it, it makes perfect sense. But, um, you know, our portfolio companies and not only the enabling technology, but also, you know, the banks will have the, I think, have, you know, have the, the technological skills to actually innovate very quickly and take advantage of these new products. Yeah, I think Nimbus rolling out the payment protection distribution platform in three days is emblematic of that. Um, yeah, well, Matt, this has been extremely exciting. Thanks so much. And uh, of course, uh, you know, for the UT alums and also others watching this uh, interview, if you would like to get in touch with us, please uh, go to our website, www.financialservicescapital.com. Thanks for that, Ivan. And before we go, I can't uh, uh, miss the opportunity to give a shout out to all my Texan friends and to let you know that I'm still true to my Texan roots. Uh, our little interview venue is graced by a map of the Republic of Texas as drawn by the UK government uh, when it recognized Texas's sovereignty as a republic, and that's the first flag. And we also have uh, copies of the first sets of Republic of Texas currency on our walls here. Um, these were printed in Austin and signed by Mirabu B. Lamar, and those were printed in Houston, which was the first capital of the republic signed by Sam Houston. So, um, hook of horns. <laughs> <laughs>